Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. So today I am very, very excited because I am being joined by one of my favorite sex educators, one of my favorite YouTubers, Shan Booty. Shan Booty. Hello there lovers and friends. We're going to be talking all about how to deal with erectile dysfunction in a relationship or with a sexual partner. And this video is sponsored by Eve Adam. They're an online pharmacy where you can get contraception and erectile dysfunction treatments. It is all online, so you don't have to wait for any doctor's appointments, you don't have to leave your house, and prescriptions get delivered straight to your door. If you haven't seen it already, I did a kind of part one to this video where we talked about what is erectile dysfunction? How do erections even happen in the first place? And all of that good stuff. And in that video, I talked about Eve Adams' erection poll, which is an erection survey. And you know how I love me, a good sexy survey. And it was aimed at the partners of people who could potentially experience erectile dysfunction and all about that dynamic and what they did when it happened or what they might do if it happened. So Shan and I are going to be looking through the results of this survey and chatting through them. And then also because Shan is just an incredible relationship expert, intimacy expert, we're going to be giving you some advice on how to deal with ED in a relationship with an acronym that I came up with, you know, it's super, super original. Compassion, orgasm, communication, knowledge, and slow. And we will get to what all of that is about shortly. But first, let's dive into the findings from the erection poll. Okay, Shan, are you ready to go through the erection poll results? I am not just ready, I am titillated. Does that make sense? I'm not sure, I just wanted to say tit. Fair enough, tit. We're gonna be talking about dicks a lot in this video, so why not just get a tit in there at the beginning? Okay, so before we get into the survey, I think it's a good idea to kind of like contextualize ourselves with who these people are. So the gender split, because we're talking about partners of people who might experience erectile dysfunction, and the gender split of people who answered the survey, it was 86% women, 11% men, and 3% non-binary. And then the age split was 53% 18 to 25 year olds and 36% 26 to 35 year olds. So we're mostly talking about young women, but some men in there, some non-binary people in there as well. Okay, what did you think of this, Shan? So 62% of the people who answered said that they had had a partner who has experienced erectile dysfunction. Was that like higher or lower than you expected? Lower than I expected, what about you? I don't know, cause I feel like, cause you could answer the survey if it was like hypothetical, like you might, but I still think it's pretty high. I think that most people, I mean, I can speak for myself. I've experienced this twice before mm -hmm. um, and with both times with different partners. So I think I would have thought that everybody has had this happen at least once in their life. Have you had an experience before? I think like once or twice, but honestly, like if I try and remember who it was with or like what happened, complete blank. <laughs> it clearly didn't leave that much of an impression. They're pretty vivid in my mind. Really? Um, just be, I think, I mean, we'll, we'll go into the stats and like, I think a lot of what was shown in this survey and really did highlight that. I mean, I was in my early twenties at the time. And so I didn't have a lot of experience. And I had tons of insecurities, which is the perfect recipe to make erectile dysfunction a much bigger deal than it has to be. Yeah. Oh my God. And we will so get into that as well, um, in terms of the impact of ED on relationships. So the biggest reason why people thought that it happened, um, was because of stress and nerves. Does that kind of correlate with your experience as well, you think? I'm actually pretty impressed with that because a lot of people, I mean, I did another project on erectile dysfunction a couple of years ago, and about 75% of women said that when their partner had ED, they equated that to their own lack of desirability. Mm. And a lot of men in general, or people with penises who have ED, often do correlate to like stress or to like something funky happening in the relationship. And something that I would thought was so profound from the work I did back then was that about 80% of erectile dysfunction is caused by physiological issues. So not the mental, but the body instead. Mm. But we place so much emphasis that we have all this control over our bodies. And to that, I always tell people like, <laughs> 
tell your pancreas to stop moving right now <laughs> or to stop working. Ask your kidneys to take five minutes off. Like we don't have this complete mind body control. And yet when it comes to our sex, um, our, our genitals, our sexual organs, we tend to think that like it's completely linked with how we're feeling or what we desire to do. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I hadn't even like thought of it like that, that we don't expect that same kind of connection from our other body parts <laughs> necessarily. Yeah. We know that they're going to do what they're going to do and they've got their off days and there's things that we can explain and things that we can't, but ultimately a lot of it also has to do with lifestyle. Mm. Um, so maybe the stress part actually is an indicator that people are starting to realize that, that it's just not about like, I didn't find my partner attractive, that there's a lot of other things at play that cause ED. Yeah. And I think there's the, the myth that um, arousal and genital response are like correlated, like one happens yes. and the other like definitely happens when you could have a genital response and not feel aroused or you could feel really, really aroused and have no genital response. So the other thing that came out of this survey is that um, the majority of the people who answered it, the partners said that their reaction was to reassure their partner and to suggest doing some other kind of sexual activity. What do you think of that? That also kind of shows that there's like this good understanding as well amongst people. Can we talk about the obvious bias that happened with this survey? And that is yourself and myself did a lot of the promoting of it. And as a result, you've got people who are in the community yeah. who are having these dialogues. That's one of the things I was thinking about hopeful. as well. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, kudos to the work that you have done, Hannah, in educating your audience and, and the you. work that I think overall has happened. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to take the kudos too. <laughs> but it. I think, you know, hopefully this is an indicator that a lot more people are investing more time and energy in understanding sexuality beyond their own experiences, because this is a super mature, insightful, and caring response. Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, just two years ago when I worked on a project, a lot of it was based around the humiliation and the fear. Um, and then from the partner's perspective, the sadness and the lack of connection, mm -hmm. the lack of desirability they experience as a result of ED. So now that people are actually, you know, in this, um, you know, two years later, we now see that people are understanding and are suggesting other activities mm -hmm. and are being empathetic and compassionate. Like that's incredible. Yeah. And I know that like one of the things that you really strive for in the content that you make is all about getting people to realize that they can be their own experts in sex and their own sex lives and their own relationships. And that's kind of like what is coming through here for me as well. It's like people like being the expert in their own, in their own sex. <laughs> Yes, yeah, like given the advice in the moment to themselves that they want to get from somebody else, like this exactly, and it's so difficult in these scenarios because when we are in a sexual setting, like we are aroused, number one, but two, like our sense of insecurity is, is elevated, our yeah. lack of sureness in ourselves. That and so vulnerability. The vulnerability is the perfect storm for us to have the not so great response in the moment when unexpected things happen. And so mm -hmm. the fact that people are like taking a moment to say, let me just think about what I would want someone to say and I'm gonna say that thing. Bravo mm, to you. Yes, that is so true. Okay, so on to what people said about the impact of ED on their relationships. So 52% said that it made no difference. That's great. 26% um, said that it brought them closer together, which is, is not surprising to me because something like that can it is a vulnerable moment and can allow for like more communication and more closeness and intimacy. And 22% did say that it had a negative effect on the relationship. But then there was another question about the negative impact and it said it wasn't the ED itself that was the problem. The majority of people said that it was the not talking about it that became the problem. A thousand percent. And interestingly, just before I actually advertised the survey on my Instagram, I did a poll that just asked people, would you break up with somebody who was struggling to maintain an erection consistently in your relationship? Mm. And 75% of people said that they would break up with that person. Ooh. I think though, in the context of this survey though, 
when you started actually reading and seeing the various responses and considering the fact that it's not just you going through this and it is extremely common and that there are other ways to manage it and there is um, help out there, people started to rethink what their initial gut response was. Maybe. Because the truth is you can work through it together, but you have to be in open communication. And then finally, this question really intrigued me. Um, which is about the importance of penetrative sex for people. And 68% of people, if only it was 69, um, <laughs> said that they <laughs> like it. They said that they like it in rotation with other activities, which I think is where I would put myself. And then 20% said that it's the best part of sex. 7% said prefer other sexual activities and 6% said I could never have it again and be fine. I think that my favorite stat on uh, people who have vulvas sexual pleasure, the, the base favorite stat is that two thirds of people um, cannot achieve orgasm with penetration alone. Mm -hmm. And that also is to state that one third can achieve orgasm some of the time with penetration as well as other activities. And then there's a third of people who for them penetration is how they get their best orgasms. Mm. And direct clitoral stimulation is too uncomfortable or oral sex is not preferred for them. So that, what you just said broken down, kind of just speaks to that stat. And I think it just also is important to, to see that like for some people penetration is not what they're interested in when it's actually like the default sex act that we just assume is what is real sex or like going all of the way. There's like so much language and messaging around penetration being like the holy grail of sex acts, specifically penis and vagina penetration as well. I like that there's people out there who are just like, yeah, I could never have it again and I'd be absolutely fine. I'm like, good for you. Like, Yes. Do you know what I also think though? There has actually been an overcorrection because when I first started in this space 15 years ago, there was still this dialogue around like, where's the clitoris? It's so hard <laughs> to find. And there was this notion still, that Freudian notion that a clitoral orgasm was immature or inferior. Yeah. That when you actually know your body and when you actually come into your own, you can achieve an orgasm through penetration. A mature and then as a orgasm. result, I feel like a mature orgasm, mm. a, an orgasm with a tie on. Uh, I think now, thanks to the work that we have done and the work around, I'm going to say, clitoracy, which is literacy Yay. of the clitoris, now there's an understanding that the, the clitoris is actually the primary sexual organ for people with vulvas uh, when it comes to achieving orgasm. But because it's been promoted so much, I know a lot of people who achieve orgasm through penetration who are like, I now feel like the way that I orgasm is not represented. Ooh. I now feel there's not enough dialogue about what brings me pleasure. I now have partners who are saying to me, if you don't um, like oral, it's because you're ashamed of yourself. <gasps> Versus like, no, no, I don't like it because my body doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to leave more space for there to be nuances in how people with vulvas experience orgasm. Yes, for sure. Okay, Shan, are you ready for my uh, Cox? acronym of advice. I have never been titillated by anything else there it, more there, than this COX acronym. There it is with the tits again. Okay, so COX stands for compassion, orgasm, communication, knowledge, and slow. And we're gonna take things slow and go through these one at a time. Okay, so the first C stands for compassion. And this is basically just all about what we were kind of talking about before of like treating your partner with kindness, really trying to like put yourself in their shoes because experiencing ED can have an impact on your self-esteem and it could have an impact on the partner's self-esteem as well. Cause like you said, thinking that it's got something to do with if your partner desires you as well. So it's really understanding that it's like nobody's fault. I love that too, because compassion really is uh, active towards other people, right? It's you should be compassionate towards yourself. But I think when we hear that word, we think of how do I give not just sympathy, but empathy. And sympathy is when you look on at someone's experience on the outside and say, ooh, that must suck. Mm -hmm. and empathy is when you crawl right in there with them and try to think about how it feels to be that person in that moment. And so I think of compassion, I think actively trying to empathize with someone else. And that means taking ourselves out of our own body and our own experiences. Mm -hmm. I have worked with a lot of women who have sex with men who said that when their partner wasn't able to get hard, I had one person in particular who said that every time he couldn't get hard, she would burst into tears because it was just a reminder of how unlovable that she was. 
And while, of course, that's an important thing to know about yourself, maybe to address with a licensed healthcare professional or talk about with your partner, in that moment when your partner is the one whose body isn't performing in a way that they expect, uh, making it about yourself probably isn't the healthiest response. And it actually makes it more difficult for your partner to overcome ED because now they have that additional stressor of, oh my gosh, if I can't perform, I'm actually gonna end up hurting my partner. Yeah. And that performance anxiety decreases your chance of actually giving your body a chance to do what it naturally and normally does. So I loved the compassion component. So these are some quotes from people's response to the survey that I think encapsulates this compassion piece. Um, so one person said, I just held them whilst they shouted and cried in frustration. I spoke calmly to them, reassured them that they were still sexy to me. That's so beautiful. I also want to say that kudos to her partner um, who experienced ED for being vulnerable. I think what happens is a lot of people who have the experience of their penis not getting erect when they want it to, don't know how to react and end up shutting their partner out. So the fact that that person allowed you to be a part of their response, I think is really beautiful. And moments like these are possible because of that vulnerability. All right, we were able to laugh about it and carried on with other things still together five years later. Yes, I love this one as well because I'm so big on humor in the bedroom and I know that it's not for everybody, um, but I think humor is a really powerful thing, especially when things don't go the way that you want. <laughs> As gay men, I almost feel like it's easier because it's really easy for us both to recognize that unfortunately it happens because it's both happened to us. There you go. There's that empathy, literal empathy, because they're both like, yeah, same mate. <laughs> same. Been there. <laughs> I love that. Okay. O stands for orgasm. And what I mean by this is actually let's not even think about orgasms. Well, no, orgasms are great. But what I want to do is separate orgasm from sexual pleasure because sexual pleasure can be a whole host of other things that do not involve an orgasm and really expanding our definition of sex. Cause kind of like I said earlier, we are so obsessed with penetration, um, which means that we are also very obsessed with erections uh, and them functioning. Um, and having that kind of like goal oriented sex of like achieving an erection, having an ejaculation, being goal oriented when it comes to sex can actually like make those things more difficult. Oh, much more difficult. And I think that it takes out the joy and the possibility for joy mm. because it's like not in the destination, but in the journey and how you get there and the exploration. But that's impossible to do that if you're not present. If you're always like forward, forward, onward, onward, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to really sit in the now. So Dr. Emily Morris has this definition of orgasm that I'm obsessed with. Ooh. And it is a sudden release of sexual tension. So mm -hmm. there's so many different ways. Because some people, orgasm is not a wave of euphoria. Some people, it's not the rapid contractions. Some people don't experience the buildup. So you can define orgasm when suddenly there has been a massive release of sexual tension. Yeah. And I think with that definition, a lot more people can fit themselves into what makes up a good sex life. Okay, some wonderful quotes about pleasure and expanding our definition of sex. I don't even care for vaginal intercourse in the first place, to be honest. So I was relieved, lol. I can relate to this one. I, I definitely know it. as somebody who doesn't orgasm from vaginal penetration, um, I can relate to this. There's things that I love about it a lot, but you know, just go with the waves. Maybe it's a break that day. And I, I like that they had like a lighthearted energy about that. Yeah, just like, oh, phew, <laughs> we don't have to do that. <laughs> I said it's fine and we made out. I think making out is underrated. I told him I didn't care and penetration isn't my favorite activity. I think it made both of us reconsider what sex is. I think we should all do this internal work of defining sex. I feel like we handled it well. Both of us enjoyed the night and when it happens again, we know that it isn't either of our faults and maybe try other things such as pegging, etc. I just want to say I love pegging, etc. Like she just brushed over it. Like like pegging, whatever, move yeah, on. Yeah, that was why I included this one. I just love it. It was just like, like pegging, obviously. I love that. And also I really love that this person said when it happens again, I love that acknowledgement of, hey, it happens, you know? Okay, our next C is communication. Uh, 
you know, it's not gonna be a video about sex where I don't yell, communicate. I think what's really important though, what the survey did is it provided a framework for communication. One of my biggest pet peeves is that quote that like the key to happy relationships is communication. The key to great sex is communication, which I feel is an oversimplified um, instruction because it's kind of like saying, the key to great art is paint. Do <laughs> you want to be more specific? Like what canvas should I use? What kind of paint? What kind Ooh, of brushes? Yeah. Like when we just throw out these brush stroking bits of advice, it doesn't really clarify for people. Like, what do I say? What do I ask for? How do I get the conversation started? What are some possible responses I should be aware of so I'm not caught off guard when my partner says something? So I think that the survey did a really great job of providing a framework for how to talk about ED and some really good thought starters. Yeah, what would be your advice in terms of how to communicate about ED? Curiosity is always the best one. Um, and curiosity that's not like probing for specific responses. There's this beautiful word that I learned that's called tacit knowledge. And so tacit knowledge is knowledge that you know, but you don't have the language for. It's like the gut feeling knowledge. So sometimes when we ask somebody, how are you feeling? They might know how they're feeling, but they don't have the language to put that into words. So when we ask our partner a question like, how are you feeling right now? Especially after that just happened, giving space to them not to have a perfect, like I'm fine, I'm happy, I'm sad. Like give room, like I'm feeling um, my left shoulder is hurting or like my stomach, you know, my, my stomach is in knots right now. Like those more specific nuanced answers that don't necessarily put a word, but describe the feeling. I think that's what's really important to have in these moments. I think that's so good to say as well, because I've had situations in my relationship where I've had that tacit knowledge <laughs> that I've really struggled to communicate. And I've just had to say like, I don't know how to explain this. Um, and it means that that conversation is really long because I'm like, it kind of feels like this, but not quite like that. And like, maybe I also feel a bit like this and you know, you, you struggle through it. Um, and that's kind of like part of that process. Like communication isn't like a tick box exercise of like, we communicated, you know, done. It's like this ongoing schlog a lot of the time. Okay. So someone in the survey said, I just wanted to know what was going on in his mind and body. And I feel that so much. Like you just want to kind of like go inside somebody's brain and understand everything. Like I totally get that urge. I love that too, but I think you have to also be prepared for that person not to have the yeah. answers. And that's also okay. Yeah, absolutely. They might not know what's going on. <laughs> Although I said, it's okay. It was all I could think about after the fact. I wanted answers, but didn't want to seem insensitive. Mm. This kind of speaks to what you were saying about having that curiosity, but not being too probing about your questions. So the K is for knowledge. And we kind of touched on this already, but for me personally, I think one of the things that has really helped me is actually being armed with the correct information about how bodies work and how arousal works and how desire works. And again, when you arm yourself with the knowledge of how an erection works, it's so understandable that it's not going to be 100% functional all the time. Uh, I had a really beautiful uh, diagram of it once that like described it kind of like uh, pumping up an air mattress and you know, if you've had an air mattress before, they don't always function perfectly. And there's a leak somewhere that happens, which makes it not perfect, but usually just a matter of <laughs> troubleshooting and putting a patch somewhere. Um, yeah. It's like I've had air mattresses around for, for decades, but when you go to use them every time, there's somewhat of a problem. So I, I feel like if we just had more of an understanding to your point, Hannah, we would have a lot more compassion. Yeah, um, and really understanding that like, just because you don't have an erection doesn't mean that you don't fancy the person you're with, doesn't mean that you're not aroused, doesn't mean that you don't, you know, you're not into it and that you don't want the sex to happen. Um, I think we place a lot of emphasis on how our bodies react rather than actually, you know, asking the person like, are you into it? We kind of, we think that it's the genitals that are telling the truth when actually it's, you know, our minds that are gonna be telling the truth. So these are some other quotes from the survey about this. It wasn't until this survey that I realized he may have had ED. I was 19 at the time, and so I thought ED was for old geezers. And this is another knowledge piece, is that it can happen to anybody with a penis, no matter what your age is. 
I think even anecdotally in the comment section below, if you have a penis and it's happened to you, let us know. If you've been with somebody um, who it's happened with, let us know. And then also let us know at what age it happened. My experience with ED was when I was in my mid twenties. And there is, uh, I think I believe it's one in three people will experience erectile dysfunction before the age of 30. And it's 40 million people in the U S alone who have issues with either, um, frequent, uh, or sometimes more than frequent erectile dysfunction. I handle it how I've seen in the movies because that's all I had to reference. I think we underestimate the sex education power of movies and TV shows and these fictional stories that we see around us because often they're the only depictions of like sex and relationships that exist for our consumption outside of porn. And often in the movies, it's always treated in a kind of like humiliation, joke, like it's kind of like that kind of storyline. Yeah, I'm getting a mental picture of someone being like, oh, come on, baby, come on, come on, come on. Just give me five more minutes, give me 10 more minutes. Come on, come on. Like that <laughs> yeah. kind of like coaxing that's happening. And the person um, who's with that partner looking at them like, you're lame. And so yeah, to your point, I think it always is sort of that in that comedic cycle, it's very rare that that's a cause for compassion, which is even more kudos mm -hmm. to the audience for 65% of them saying compassion actually was their go-to response. I straight up told him it was nothing to be embarrassed about because it was science. I love this response. <laughs> because science. Because science. Because science. And the S stands for slow. And I wanted to include this, I wanted to make it cox instead of just cock, because I think this is a really important piece for that kind of in the moment, like you might be experiencing ED, but in that sexual moment, you might be able to overcome it if you take the pressure off, really take your time, slow things down. Like that pressure to perform can <laughs> impact your ability to perform. Um, also, I'm not a fan of the word perform in this context because it's not a performance, it's a experience. I think that slow is a beautiful addition to this and exactly what you said that a lot of people's bodies might respond to additional stimulation or they might respond when the pressure is removed and they're not even thinking about it anymore. But by staying in it with your partner and finding other ways to keep the moment going, whether it ends in erection or it doesn't, you're gonna guarantee that you're gonna have a positive experience. And that's what slow really is speaking to. It's less about like, we'll get there eventually, but more about let's enjoy ourselves. We are where we're at, it is what it is. Let's have fun in the process. And this person said, I took it down a notch, made things a lot more erotic and slow for deeper impact. Eventually he got it up, but this guy works from home, which we all know is code for jacking off all day. I love this person's use of the word erotic because I think that's kind of the mood that it speaks to for me. Um, but I have qualms about the jacking off all day. I work from home and I only jack off some of the time. Okay. <laughs> I work from home, I jack off all the time. So, nuance. <laughs> Hannah, thank you so much for having me and you're coming over to my place in a couple days. So, yes. I wanna make it just as cute for you because you hosted a great party today at a ball. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming to my erection party, my Cox party. Any final words about erectile dysfunction, about relationships? Oh my gosh, I hate final words. Titillation. I have to just, we'll start it that way, we're gonna end that way. <laughs> thank you so much for watching and thank you so much to Shan for joining me. We also did a video over on her YouTube channel and there'll be a link to that in the description. Thank you so much to Eve Adam for sponsoring this video and I have a special discount code for you if you are interested in using their service. If you use the code UKPOL10, you'll get 10% off your first treatment. I hope you enjoyed this video and do leave all of your thoughts on erections and erectile dysfunction and communication and all of that good stuff in relationships. If you have any experiences that you want to share um, with the rest of the community, then feel free to do so in the comments and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.